Good morning. Good morning. Our first reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 7, verses 10 through 16, and can be found on page 636 of your Pew Bible. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David. Is it too little for you to weary mortals, that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son, and shall name him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to refuse evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. The second reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 to 25 and is found on page one of the New Testament in the Pew Bible. The birth of Jesus the Messiah. Now, the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. The epistle reading is from Romans, chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, a letter of Paul to the Romans. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle set apart from the gospel for, of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures, the gospel concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for among all the Gentiles for the sake of his name, including yourselves, who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all God's beloved in Rome who are called to be saints, Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord, Jesus Christ. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Lord God, empty me of me and fill me with you so that the words of my mouth are only yours spoken through me. And Lord, open the ears of the hearers here today, that they may hear what it is you are calling on their hearts to take from this message into the world. We pray this all in your precious name. Amen. Two weeks ago, I shared with you that keeping Christ in Christmas means sharing Christ's peace with the world. 
That same week, a member of this congregation had shared with me about the Pagan's version of Silent Night that was deeply disturbing her. Things like this being thrown in one's face makes it difficult to keep Christ in Christmas by sharing God's peace. Just last week, someone shared with me a unique way that one person attempted to keep Christ in Christmas and perhaps respond to those Christian songs that are being usurped. I imagine everyone here is familiar with the song, 12 Days of Christmas. Now, there's a story that has been going around regarding this carol. Someone had shared that story with me, and it is about the idea that persecuted Catholics had used this carol to help young Catholics remember their catechism. Now, based off this story's time frame and some other factors, and a little Google, I realize that this story is not likely true. However, I think the fact that someone took the time to take a seemingly secular song and put a Christian spin on it was a fun way of trying to keep Christ in Christmas. However, as this story goes, as this song goes, the partridge in a pear tree represented Jesus. The two turtle doves, the books of the Old Testament and New Testament. Three French hens represented faith, hope, and charity. The four calling birds represented the four gospels. The five golden rings represented the first five books of the Old Testament, and so on and so forth. This person, in their own way, tried to put Christ back in Christmas. They took a secular song and put their own Christ spin on it. Now, I'm not saying that there's something wrong with doing this, but I am going to suggest that we follow the example given to us in today's gospel as a better way of keeping Christ in Christmas. In today's reading, we see the familiar story, the one we hear every year about God's messenger coming to Joseph with the good news of the coming of Christ and what his role would be in all of that. However, if we examine this story closely, we will observe that keeping Christ in Christmas means sharing not only peace, but also love. Love is present in this story in many ways, ways we may not have noticed before. First, of course, and foremost, is the obvious. God's love is poured out in the giving of this gift of Jesus, who, as it says, will be the Messiah coming to save his people from their sins. As John will later share, God so loved the world that he gave his only son to come and save all people from perishing. But the love doesn't stop there. As it tells us here, Mary and Joseph were engaged. And there were Deuteronomic laws regarding engagement and marriage. And one of them was to stone a woman who became pregnant while betrothed to a man. Joseph, as it says here, being a righteous man, didn't want to expose her to this outcome and planned to dismiss her privately. To see the love evident here, though, means understanding this word righteous. Because here, this word righteous involves conforming to God's standard of justice. God's standard of justice that we know, first and foremost, is led by love. So in just his willingness to dismiss her privately, we see Joseph's first act of love in this story. It may not seem like much since we've heard this story time and time again and it's getting old after a while. So to help us out, I want to put a little modern context on it for us. There's a gentleman that I know 
who was married to someone and had two children with her. And unfortunately, as we all too often hear, she stepped outside the marriage. And he knew that what she had done was wrong and he was devastated by it. But he also knew that as God calls us to love those who make mistakes anyway, as such, he continues to see that her needs are met. Now, if we are honest, and if I'm being honest, we can agree that we likely felt some sort of disdain towards this woman at just hearing about what she had done. Now, with that, let us return to what it must have been like for Joseph to willingly dismiss her privately by displaying this amazing act of love. Love of God that defies societal expectations. But before Joseph can even act in this righteous way, God intervenes with love for both him and Mary. God sends a messenger to explain this child's birth as a gift of love to all people, and Joseph's role was to love and care for Jesus as his own child. Now, a point that is often missed is that in naming Jesus, Joseph actually adopts Jesus into his family. In those times, naming a child meant they became a part of your family, and it was the, only the male that could do that. It was their form of adoption. Joseph displayed the amazing love that many adoptive parents show when they take on the act of caring for a child that they did not conceive themselves. We also see love in the other name given to Jesus by the people, Emmanuel. The people name him Emmanuel, meaning God with us, because they see his, him as a sign of love in a time when they desperately needed a savior to set them free. Finally, we even see love in the last verses, when Joseph, loving God, obediently took Mary as his wife, but did not have marital relations with her until she gave birth to Jesus. Love is hidden all over this passage that is focused on Joseph's role in the Christmas story. So often love is present around us, but we miss it because we get so swept up in all the things going on in the world's negativity. We can keep Christ in Christmas by not only noticing where that love is present, but also highlighting it and sharing that same love of Christ with others. Anytime love is present, so is God, because God is love. Ultimately, in this story, we recognize love in that Joseph didn't violate convention to be politically rebellious or to even know his own goodness. He violated societal expectations because God intervened, sharing with him the love that he was about to bless the world with. And in turn, Joseph shared that love as he was called to do. Maybe we need to answer the call and take this gift of love that God has given us and share it with those around us to keep Christ in Christmas not only today but all year long. Often things that go against the norm, that go against conventional ways are the best way to display the Spirit's work, to display Christ in Christmas. Think about those Hallmark movies. It is the unconventional ways that love is shown that hooks people in and offers them that positive feeling inside. The glimpse of Christ, even if they don't know it themselves. What we learn from this gospel's message of that first Christmas is that without love, Christmas would have never happened. Without Christians continuing that love and sharing it with those around them, Christ can't come again each Christmas. Yet, as with peace, God's love 
will always be kept in Christmas because there will always be Christians and other people sharing God's love with one another. We just have to notice it. We as Christians are called by God to live by the examples given to us in scriptures. We recall that Christ called us to love others as he loved us. As we near Christmas, may we remember that Christ called us to love and that keeping Christ in Christmas isn't about fighting back against all of those other traditions and celebrations that are this time of year. It isn't about creating stories to seek that com and combat the secular world's attempt to remove Christ out of Christmas. What it does mean is sharing not only Christ's peace, but also the love that began with the coming of Christ. It means keeping Christ in Christmas through our words and actions that display all of the Christmas central themes, love, peace, hope, and joy. It means we are called to act with love, peace, hope, and joy not only in this season, but all year long for the sake of the gospel and the sake of the world. Amen.